whiteboard. All right, guys, on your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the gentleman who's going to nationalize the Suez Canal? This is an old one, so even if you weren't here yesterday, you got this. What is the name of the gentleman who nationalized the Suez Canal? Hey, Reed, were you not here on Friday? Oh, so you're just like mill, milling it in. You just have no idea. Perfect. Maya. Nassar. on your whiteboard. Have you watched any of my videos? You're just living life, huh? Just living. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the gentleman who's going to champion this uh, pa Pakistani state? What is the name of the gentleman who's going to uh, support? Look at you, found a little cheat. It runs out real quick, though. Who is it? Who is it, Alexandra? Muhammad Ali Jannah. Muhammad Ali On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name, uh, what year does the Pakistani state get created? 47. What year, Lauren? 47. On your whiteboard, please tell me, uh, Israel was carved out of what country? Yeah, you have a lot. <laughs> Adrian. Palestine. Palestine. On your whiteboard, what year does uh, Israel become an official state? Good. Don't wink at me, Dean. Don't no, wink at me. No, I didn't wink at you. I, because I got that one wrong. From I know, I know. Just Palestine. don't wink at me. It makes I me didn't. so uncomfortable. I didn't wink. It makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> I nodded my head in approval. And then you went. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. It makes me really uncomfortable. Yeah. Dean, what is it? What year? 1940. <laughs> On your whiteboard, please tell me what is, um, <clears throat> please tell me who created the state of Israel? Who is it, Jack? The UN. The UN. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is, um, <clears throat> please tell me what is the name of the communist leader of China post World War II? China. China. Who is it? Aiden. Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. On your whiteboard, who is the communist leader of Vietnam? What is it, Maya? Ho Chi Minh. Uh, what English colony is going to get their independence? Very calmly and coolly, they're going to be like, hey, England, I like my independence. And England's like, you know what? That's a great idea. You should have it. Who is it? Jack. Ghana. Ghana. On your whiteboard, what English colony had to fight with non-resistance? Yeah. You thought I was going left. No, that was definitely not non-resistance. Definitely not non-resistance. What is it, Molly? India. India. Which one fought tooth and nail to get their independence? There you go. Am I driving you crazy yet? What is it, Alexandra? Kenya, on your whiteboard, please tell me what is, um, please tell me what is the first economic reform Mao Zedong does in China. It's somewhat successful and it's modeled after Stalin. Good. What is it, Sophia? The first five-year plan. Five plan. On your whiteboard, what is the third attempt by Mao Zedong? It is going to leave them more isolated. Good. What is it? Micah. There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me who replaces Mao after he dies. Don't look at me like that. It's so sad. Good. Who is it? Uh, Lily. Dang typing or something. Yep, sounds good to me. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is um, who has a song called "Don't Cry for Me, Argentina." The truth is, I never met you. No, it's Madonna. If you're gonna say it is Juan Perón, who's going to try to bring communism to Argentina. On your whiteboard, didn't we get there yesterday? Didn't I sing for you yesterday? 
Maybe it was just seven after the period that got there. All right, here we go. Did we get to India and the Green Revolution? We got to the Iron Iraq War. Ooh, how exciting. All right. We did? How interesting. All right, then let's go back to boards here, people. I'm not ready yet. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the country that the United States uh, CIA tried to overthrow by putting in a guy, but the guy gets caught and leads to about 400 U.S. hostages. Country. What's the name of the country? What is it? Adrian. Iran. Iran. On your whiteboard. What is the name of a non-Iranian that we give weapons, guns, everything he needs to invade Iran? Well, he tries invading Iran, and it fails significantly, so he does whatever he wants to do. Cheyenne? Um, Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. After his failure of the invasion of Iran, where does Saddam go next? Where in the world is Saddam Hussein? What country does he go to, Lauren? Kuwait. Kuwait. Uh, with Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, the United States declare war. What is the name of this war? Good, good. Micah. Gulf War. Gulf War. All right. Is that where we let? Um, on your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the first female president in India? Who happens to be the first female president anywhere? I know, India, one of the most patriarchal societies in the world, has the first female president. And here we are, 2017. Not saying that Hillary was perfect, don't get me wrong, but damn. Well, who is it? Molly. Sounds good to me. On your whiteboard. Nope, we're going. We're going here. All right, so we got all the way to Iran, Iraq, correct? Hello? Yeah. All right, then he invades Kuwait, and then we have the Gulf War, because that's when Lashter walked in, correct? I'm remembering now. Okay, so let's talk about Latin America is your next heading, please. Latin America. Oh, this is why I didn't sing to you. Don't cry for me, Argentina. Have you guys never heard of Vivita? No. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. I'm, once again, another amazing reference completely goes on down here. It's fine. So Mexico is struggling a lot. Um, I think we can all agree Mexico isn't going to really recover post American uh, post revolution. Can we agree? Um, they have a couple of high points under a couple of people, and then it plummets right back down into the darkness. Uh, they're going to try redistributing land. It does not go well. Uh, in Argentina, we're going to have uh, military growth. Is going to lead to a guy named Juan Peron and his wife Evita. Don't cry. Argentina, the truth is I never loved you, and I have no talent, and I really know that, but I am passionate, that's all that matters. If you knew the song, you'd think that was funny. It's fine. Anyway, Guatemala, maybe I'll play it for your exit today. Not very nice thing. Anyway, so U.S. is going to intervene in Guatemala and Nicaragua. We're just going to have our corporations go in and just say mine. <laughs> Anyone know what we're getting out of Nicaragua? Sugar. Have you ever used Domino Sugar? You ever seen Domino Sugar? Oh, my God. You have seen Domino Sugar. Your mom probably or your dad, whoever cooks in your house, has Domino Sugar. It's like the brown sugar. It's in a box with a yellow label. Good talk, guys. Really good talk. Isn't it like a brand? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's not everywhere. It's not it white now. sugar. They have white sugar. Yeah. Most people have it for their brown sugar, and you usually keep your brown sugar in a box, which is why I say brown sugar. Most people pour it into a container. The white sugar. You don't pour yours into a container? No, it's all in a container. I was thinking you were savage. 
or not putting it in a container, <laughs> and then you went the other direction saying you put all of your sugars in the container. Way cost. No, container. I keep my brown sugar in this box. You put powdered sugar. Exact opposite. You powdered sugar in a canister too? No, don't. How do you not have powdered sugar? My mom's sugar free. Oh, terrible existence. <laughs> Alright, we're moving forward. Alright. And we're done. Yay! Wait, what's it? Reagan is going to be anti-communist. I think we all knew that. Don't you own a Reagan shirt? Yes, I do. 94? 84. That would make sense, 94. He's definitely done. Alright, are we good? No. <laughs> Wait, so are we like done done? No, we have one more chapter, and then we are done. Oh. I'll be done. I'll finish content by tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday? Yeah. I'll finish content in class tomorrow with you. What? I have, like, 20 minutes. I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push. Right. Lauren's holding me back, though. Sorry. She's holding me back. All right, here we go. So, revolutionary. That's fine. All right, end of the cold year. So, end of cold year. Did I just say cold year? <laughs> so, I'm really not feeling well. I've been sick for like six weeks, have you noticed? I'm like super congested. I have a double ear infection and double sinus infection. So, I'm pretty excited. Yeah. Because I'm um, apparently on both sides, I guess. Do you just like not breathe through those? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, the lady said, the lady was like in her mid 30s and she was like, so big news for both of us. And I was like, okay, like this isn't how I want my doctor to be telling me what's wrong. And she's like, you have double ear infection and double sinus infection. And I was like, oh, wonderful. And she's like, big news for me is that I haven't diagnosed anyone over the age of 12 with a double ear infection in like 10 years. <laughs> so, pretty exciting. Hey! Hey! My mother doesn't take care of me anymore. <laughs> so I'm supposed to do it for myself which means I don't do it okay don't judge and I'm not feeling well thanks for caring you're just making fun of me <laughs> here we go so end of cold war Ronald Reagan is going to be in office for the end of the cold war he is um, going to be um, obviously a huge player with it um, he causes the USSR the evil empire and because of Reagan, Reagan is going to promote huge military spending here in the United States. So obviously the US, uh, USSR has to compete, which is going to kill their economy. Okay, Gorbachev is the last Soviet leader. Now it's weird. I'm <laughs> under Gorbachev, Soviet Union ends, and he's going to start the post-Soviet Union. He's going to start the post-Russian <laughs> period. What? With lead? <laughs> All right, so you are going to write underneath this little heading, reasons for the Soviet collapse. Okay, so before I get there, I do want to explain something because I don't think I did a very good job because World War II in World War Cold War. Cold War. All right. This is Europe. Yeah, it's Italy. Italy goes yeah. Whoa. Well, it doesn't the boot. Oh, stop. That's just not people watching the video. No, it's fine. It's fine. Who cares about those people? <laughs> Alright, so here's Europe and here's the USSR. So the USSR is going to be shaped, of course, in 1917. They're going to go to World War II. Um, at the end of World War II in 1945, is there a relationship between Stalin and the West, good or bad? Bad, absolutely. Eisenhower, who's going to be the general of our European campaign, is going to say, why don't we just invade the Soviet Union now, three days after the fall of Europe? Um, because we're going to have to do it anyway. And Truman's like, no, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't. We're not going in. We're not going in. We're not going in. You don't have to draw my Europe if you don't want to. Oh, no. 
You don't. Okay, good. Yeah, don't drop my hair. Just listen. So what's going to happen is, is that um, so the Soviet Union in the United States and all of the West are going to be at odds. So as soon as the Soviets are kind of going back home after the war, they start creating these little states. Okay, so here is Poland. Here is the Czech Republic, a Czech Slovakia. Uh, we have Hungary, and then we have stop, uh, some sort of stand. You know, whatever. Okay. So what's going to happen is, as they're coming back, uh, is the Soviet Union fearful of an attack by the West? Hello. Uh, yes. Eisenhower literally made a big petition in order to just invade the Soviet Union and just get it over with. So what they're going to do is they're going to put countries here in order to protect them. What we call these are called buffer countries. These are countries that are there only to essentially uh, protect the Soviet Union. Okay. Now, what the Soviet Union does once it has these buffer countries all set up, he, uh, Soviet Stalin says, hey, by the way, if you convert to communism, we will give you a monthly spending of a million dollars. Every single month, we'll send you a million dollars. Now, Poland, who has just been completely destroyed by the Germans, are like, a million dollars for just saying yes to communism? All right. So what happens is, over the next fit, uh, less than 40 years, the Soviet Union, every single month, is sending a check to all of these countries. And their checks are completely dependent on by these countries that everything is based on that check. So what's happening is post-World War II, the Soviet Union's doing okay. They're making money and all this stuff. However, when the United States, especially with Reagan, especially if you've been listening to the news lately, Trump, everything he's trying to do with his military right now is like, I'm just trying to bring it, bring it back to Reagan size, Reagan size, Reagan size. Because Reagan really thought there could be a Cold War. It was right before the Soviet collapse and looked like we were going to go to war. So Reagan created a massive military. With that being said, the Soviets are spending a lot more money on military. So if they're spending a lot more money on military, are they able to pay their monthly stipends? So what's going to happen is, is they're going to stop paying. Okay? These countries over here that are receiving the check, which are the same as buffer countries, are also known as satellite countries. Satellite countries are doing the will of another country based on payment. Now, why would... Stalin wants satellite countries to pick up communism. Buffer countries are just on geographic. Satellite countries are based on policy. What, thinking back to that primary source that we read, why does Stalin want other countries to be communists? Micah? They're like, so they're all under one like, um, policy. Okay. And so is it, what is their kind of theory with that? More united, the more of them there are, the harder it is to fall, correct? Hello? So the priority between all of these communist countries is that they trade with other communist countries, so they're kind of self-dependent to a degree. So all of these countries are called satellite countries because they all depend on each other, specifically the Soviet Union, to keep paying their bills. Cuba is also involved. Well, when that check stops coming, okay, the demand for goods stop coming because the economy is tanking, what do you think these countries are going to do? Are they going to continue following communism? Or are they going to have revolutions? Hello? Revolutions. revolutions. And these revolutions are going to be called the Velvet Revolutions because they're bloodless. Everyone's like, ah, well, if the Russians can't afford it, then let's do it ourselves. Okay? So we'll get there. So what's going to happen is the Soviets are going to stop paying their stipends. With that being said, all these satellite countries are going to have their velvet revolution or bloodless revolution. So communism is going to die significantly just before 1991. So the Soviets are going to lose a lot of things. So Poland is the first one to say no. Poland's the first one to say, screw you, Soviets. We're doing us. Poland's gone through a lot of hell lately. Can we agree? So it kind of makes sense. All right. Uh, Velvet Revolution, then we're going to start having East Germany decide to open up the Berlin Wall. So, going back to your list of causes for uh, reasons for a Soviet collapse. First one is going to be too many dependent satellite countries. Too many dependent satellite countries.
second thing is going to be uh, the invasion of Afghanistan. In parentheses, next year, first one, it says too many dependent countries, right? Buffer state slash satellite. satellite. Write that terminology there, please. Satellite and buffer. Your second one is the invasion of Afghanistan equals failure over nine years. Uh, invasion of Afghanistan equals failure over nine years. It takes nine years to lose. It costs a lot of money to lose in nine years. Okay. Then you're going to have the policy of perestroika, which means openness, the policy of blackness, both of those spellings are up here for you. Yep. Policy of perestroika, which means openness, and glasnost, which means, no, glasnost, which means openness, and perestroika. Those are economic and political. Perestroika is going to reshape the government in order to reflect a little bit more democratic, uh, no, capitalistic. Last notice is going to be more democratic, a little bit more freedom of the press. And these are going to lead to the downfall. How many do we have? Three. Three, Perestroika and Glasnost. And then your fourth one is going to be, um, uh, no, after that one, because that's fine. After that one, you're going to write, like, uh, you are going to write the Soviet Union collapses in 1991. Soviet Union collapses in 1991. Okay. And military spending, you could throw in there somewhere. All right. So, Soviet Union is going to collapse in 1991. Um, who's going to stand on a wall and say, Gorbachev, tear down that wall? <laughs> Who is it? Read. Reagan. There you go. All right. To the boards. Here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me who is the last Soviet leader. Who is the last Soviet leader? Who's still alive, by the way? Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. Who is it, Lily? Gorbachev. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is. Uh, what are the name? What are the two terms for countries that are dependent on the Soviet Union? Sometimes they're referred to as one because of their geographical presence, which makes it harder for invasion. The other one is because of their dependence, mostly financially, on the Soviet Union. Dean, there you go. On your whiteboard, what are the two political and economic uh, terms used to describe the changes uh, to the Russia that will cause their downfall? Good. Micah, you're on it tonight, and I love it. What are they, Micah? Oh, try it. Perfect. Perfect. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the U.S. president involved in the falling of the Soviet Union? Good. Come on, come on, come on. Good. Cheyenne. Reagan, on your whiteboard, please tell me, who does Reagan call the evil empire? Good. Who is it, Adrian? The USSR. The USSR. All right, here we go. So what we're going to have is economic globalism for the first time. Economic globalism means that we're not going to just trade within our boundaries with one other country. We're going to be trading with a lot of others. The biggest one you need to know from here is the World Trade Organization, the WTO. And that takes over from the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1995. That is what we use still today. The World Trade Organization meets every year in what city? No, it's not Washington. <laughs> New York. Every year they meet in New York. Um, we had a building that was targeted in 2001 that held the World Trade Organization. What is it? 2001 people. The Twin Towers, yes. Yeah, the World Trade Center held the World Trade Organization. That's where their major offices was. That is why they were targeted, because of globalization and the Americans being forced on other people. All right, so global corporations expand, treat globe as a single market. For instance, what that means is 
Where are most of our clothes made today? China. Actually, Bangladesh is one of the largest exporters of clothing right now. If you shop at like Forever 21 and all those other clothing brands are like on the same uh, tier as Forever 21, um, they all get their clothes from Bangladesh. Why Bangladesh? Why, Jack? Cheap labor. Absolutely. So we have American companies going to Bangladesh to have them make their clothes for cheap labor. What that does is, is all of a sudden, instead of having your local area being your source of uh, labor, you're now seeing the world as a source of labor. That it costs less to make it halfway around the world than it does to make it a block down from your storefront. That's globalization. That is globalization. Also, it's cheaper because of tax breaks. Ready? Hello, it's me. I've been wondering if you were all done so I could turn the page and go over growth in Asia. I don't know why I'm singing song you today, Lily. Don't you wish your life was a musical? To a degree. It is kind of? Yeah. Oh my God. He makes up songs. He calls them Marshall James. Alright, economic growth in Asia. So Japan is going to benefit from the Marshall Plan, a treaty to limit the uh, limitations on defense spending. The Marshall Plan is post-World War II. Uh, I think we can all agree that militarization is going to cause World War II, as we saw Hitler and his crazy military marching and all that stuff. So everyone in the world is going to sign, everyone who signs it is going to agree on limiting their amount of military force. Uh, and Japan is going to benefit the most. Why is Japan going to benefit the most? Why, Dean? It already has a ton of territory. It's also all by itself. There's no other rising power. China is a rising power at this point. But they're still the supreme leader in Asia until China hits the 1990s and then they become the dominant power. Um, Post-war economic expansion slowed in the 90s, and we have four little tigers. That's going to be the biggest economic centers in the world. It is going to be Taiwan. Hold on. You need this for your test. It's on your test. Isn't Hong Kong one of them? Hong Kong is... What? Thailand, Taiwan. No, I don't think so. Let me get, let me get my moment. <coughs> Tyler will be so disappointed. I'll be just... Alright, here we go. Here we go. It is Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. Those are your four little targets. Can you repeat that? It is Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. Look what I did. I filled this out for them last year. Isn't that nice? No, you can't. I knew test, there's a question that says, which of the following is not a tiger? A little sign. <laughs> oh, Dean. Oh, Dean. Okay, so China is going to um, benefit from having low wages and all that. They are going to do that. So we have trade blocks. So we have the European Union is going to be the largest one. Uh, European Union has been in the news because what major country exited? Britain, yes. Britain is going to exit it less than a year ago. Caused huge disasters. Um, huge economic uh, instability as well as a lot of political problems over there. Uh, so the European Union, six nations are going to form in 1957. They're going to have, yep, that treaty in 1993 moving towards political uh, in integration, what you're going to have for the European Union is that you're going to have the same currency. And what is the currency? 
the euro. You're also going to have open movement of people. That if you are a French citizen, you can easily go to England, you can easily go to Spain. These are now being called into question because of all the terrorism. So they're struggling with that, which is one of the reasons why Britain is going to cite their differences and say, let's go. Now, OPEC is a big one. It is your organization of petroleum exporting countries. You do need to know that phrase. You don't have to know EU. You don't have to know, like, WTO, fine, whatever. OPEC you do need. It is a very big deal. They dictate our life. This is um, all of your oil producing countries are part of OPEC. Only oil producing countries are in OPEC. It's established, established in 1960 and is dominated by Arab and Muslim countries. Why is it dominated by Arab and Muslim countries? Yes, that's where all the oil is, absolutely in the desert. So that makes a lot of sense. There's only one American country from any of the countries in the America that has oil. What is it? Uh, Isn't it like no, Texas? they have gas. Okay, so they don't have oil. Isn't it like Texas who has oil? Uh, yeah, they have a Texas. little bit, but they're not a large exporter of it. They ran, we ran, we used it up pretty quick. Anyone know what is the only OPEC American? Venezuela. Go Venezuela. <laughs> Venezuela, is uh, Venezuela right now doing well or terrible? Terrible. They're doing terrible. The reason is, is that OPEC is abusing their power and they're driving down the prices of oil, which is why gas is really cheap right now. Have you noticed? I guess you haven't been driving that long to really notice. But like four years ago, we were paying $4 a gallon. Now we're paying, what, $2.50. Um, and the reason is, is because Saudi Arabia, who leads OPEC, is trying to drive down the price. So people in Venezuela are selling off their oil refineries because they're not making enough money. Saudi Arabia makes so much money that they can lose hundreds of millions of dollars. It's not a big deal to them. Um, Venezuela can't stand it. So Venezuela had to sell a bunch of its oil refinery. Guess who bought it? Saudi Arabia! Yes! They drove down the price and forced uh, Venezuela to have to sell a lot of their oil and the oil producing stuff. And now Saudi Arabia now controls most of the oil refineries in Venezuela, brilliant if you're Saudi Arabia, bad for everyone else. Yay, Monopoly. Yay. So anyway, it's going to be a big deal. And then we have the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, Aishan. You should be familiar with it. Aishan is going to open up trade between all of your Asian countries, uh, specifically between Japan, China, um, Taiwan, Hong Kong, all of your like major little tigers are all pulled in. All right, then we have um, consumption of cultural interaction. Now, post-World War II, I would write post-World War II culture. All right, what is the only mass-producing country in the world not, not devastated by World War II? Aiden? America. America, absolutely. So, after World War II, everyone wants to get their life back together, wants to go to the movies, wants to go do things. Guess who's the only country producing movies immediately? America, because we have the infrastructure already in place, we can focus on whatever we want. So, America starts producing movies like crazy post-World War II. People around the world have no other option except watching American movies. So guess what everyone starts watching? American movies, which is why 1950s, 1960s, uh, the whole world gets addicted to America. Okay? What that means is we have Americanization. American culture is exported for millions and millions of dollars of profit. Like, for instance, what was the biggest hit movie in France last year? They have their own movies in France. They make movies in France. They make their own movies in Spain. They make their own movies in Taiwan, they make their own movies in Tokyo, they make their movies in every country. We only know ours, correct? Now, we don't know theirs, but they know ours. Because our movies are put into every single cinema all around the world. That's Americanization. It's the dependency of um, Hollywood. It's the dependency of American GIs. It's um, this whole idea of what America is. We're the only ones mass-producing things. 
So after the war, we kind of like sell it to everyone. Coca-Cola becomes worldwide after World War II. What do you got? What was French? I have no idea. I don't know either. I have no idea. Oh. Okay. I, I, just, I don't know because I knew you guys didn't know. <laughs> French movie going to America or was it the other way around? No, it's a French movie made in France. It's oh, the number one movie it's in France. Prince, I think. Oh, I was at the Academy Award one. I love it. It's so great. Of course she's seen it. Of course she's seen it. No one else has seen it. Probably. It's so great. It's a little child book. It's based on a children's book. It's a very very good children's book. Sure. You never read it. No. So it's like I am in my culture. I am in my culture. It's about how a kid doesn't like being an adult. So Please. Read it. It's 30 pages. I don't know. I don't know if I have time for that. Just kidding. All right. So after World War II, the United States is going to be the largest exporter of stuff. <coughs> Why uh, McDonald's is going to start spreading out American food, American ideology. It's called McDonaldization. If you go any country in the world, you can find a McDonald's, correct? You also can find, and I'm not really proud of this, KFCs. Kentucky Fried Chickens. Do you know what country in the world has the most Kentucky Fried Chickens? Mm -hmm. China. China. China has the most. Do you know what country in the world has the most Taco Bells? Thailand. I have no idea. They have more time. It's kind of good. <laughs> oh, my God. The quesadillas. Oh, my God. It's so gross. Never. I'm a McDonald's girl, personally, but it's so good. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to see is um, internal transformation. We're going to start seeing inside the United States. The Latino culture is going to be building. English language becomes predominant all around the world. It's known as the business language. So if you're in another country and you want to go into business, you learn English. Now, this textbook's a little out of date. If you want to go into business, what language should you learn? Jack? Mandarin. Mandarin, yes. And if you want to go into politics, what language should you learn? No. Arabic. If you want to go into like a government position, Arabic is the one to learn. Huh? Uh, I don't know if you've noticed. Arabic? You need to diversify your French, girl. There's a ton of people here at Plant High School that speak Arabic. Diversify, man. Yeah, diversify. Yes. I'm not going to blow up their spot. That's you to figure it out. If you've ever heard anyone speak Arabic, it's really beautiful. So last night I was watching the White Helmets. Did you watch that one? It's a other Academy Award nominated film on the Syrian refugee crisis, and they speak Arabic. I know. I'm not saying it's a plant. I'm just saying. Do you speak Arabic? Oh, hell no. I have trouble <laughs> with English. So, no. So, what you're going to see is Africa. What we're going to see is um, you're going to see a ton of growth post-World War II. What do we call our generation here? Post-World War II. Your parents. Baby boomers. Absolutely. After World War II, everyone comes home and makes babies. And that's just not here in the United States. That's all around the world. Once the war is over, everyone's like, yes, let's make babies. So climate change, um, we're going to start seeing it. Gl greenhouse glasses, uh, glasses, oh my God. Greenhouse gases are going to start being measured post-World War II. Um, they're called the Kyoto Accords in 1997, where you have the first formal uh, petition by governments around the world to argue and try to do something to preserve our uh, climate here. Okay, economic inequality. We're going to see that regional poverty is a persistent problem, even here in the United States. How much time do I have? Six oh, my God. You've got to be kidding me. I mean, just kidding. I'm enjoying this so much. I don't know. Let's look. I feel like when you go towards the end, you start going fast. Yeah, because I'm just so over it. Yeah, you're just like. We're almost done. We just said all tomorrow. Yeah, why don't you finish right now? Go. Oh, I'm getting bullied by Lauren. Things are bad if you're getting bullied by Lauren. All right, so regional poverty is a persistent problem. Uh, I don't think I have to tell you this, but poverty and homelessness is a big issue here in Tampa. Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it's also going to be worse around the world, of course. Inequal distribution of resources. Uh, what we're going to see is a lot of our African cultures were stripped of the wealth of their countries. Now that the colonial powers are out, we're going to see a lot of those resources in the hand of military groups. 
Is that really going to benefit the normal people, the good people of the country? No. Slavery is going to be abolished in Saudi Arabia and Angolia in 1960s and forced the bonded laborer remains in place in the developing world. Um, uh, three or two or three years ago, there was a lady from uh, Taiwan who said she was a slave for her master for about six years and that they uh, have pulled in. The reason why she got out is because she and her daughter tried escaping and the lady grabbed the daughter, and um, so she's going on TV and explaining that uh, slavery is still happening in your Asian country still today, saying that um, housekeepers are enslaved, and so slavery hasn't officially abolished. Obviously, we've heard of human trafficking, hello, um, and that's still going on, of course. Um, they estimate that about 250 million children from 5 to 14 work in Southeast Asia, so I personally do not shop at stores like uh, Forever 21. I don't shop in places, what's that, like Papaya? Is that the other one? What are those other like super trendy ones like that are H &M. like cheap? Huh? Like H&M. H&M is not as bad. But like your cheaper ones like Forever 21, Papaya, and other stores like that that have really cheap clothes that you can wear a couple times and you have to throw it away because it's crappy clothes. Yes? Hello? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Those places hire women and children and pay them practically nothing. There's a bunch of documentaries on Netflix that you can watch that talk about how um, Americans are destroying the third world because of our obsession with clothes. And that uh, we're destroying the economy as well as um, the environment with our clothes addiction. So, uh, global trafficking, human slaves, global diseases, we're going to um, see Ebola is obviously going to pop up. We saw that pop up and explode about two years ago. HIV is going to be a big thing that's going to start happening in the late 60s. 70s is going to be defined by it. 80s, we're going to start seeing some steps towards uh, somewhat of a cure and at least a uh, hold down. And threat throughout the world is struck the developing world. Sub-Saharan Africa is going to be hit the hardest by AIDS and HIV. So AIDS and HIV are going to hit Sub-Saharan Africa the hardest. Ebola and fever are also going to hit Sub-Saharan Africa. Why Sub-Saharan Africa? Why are they always hit the hardest? Uh, okay, so a lot of those nations don't believe in birth control, which is another big problem. Um, wow, so like... Huh? A lot of people are uneducated, a lot of people are in rural places. Uh, what else? Lots of like isolated tribes make them explode, exposed to diseases and places where there you go. And government intrusion hasn't been that strong. A lot of governments have risen and fallen in these territories, so there's no government strength here. Lauren? What if they're talking about Ebola? Um, they contained it. Really? Nope. They never said anything about it. Well, so it's, it's not like everyone has just been like... Yeah, it's not as exciting as when it started. Like, when it started, I was so scared. I thought I was going to get Ebola. Mm -hmm. no, it's not water crisis anymore. That's true. Uh, people get bored with it, um, but they've contained most of it. Well, sort of, yes. All right, so global terrorism. Terrorism should be your next uh, heading. Uh, terrorism is deliberate, systematic use of violence against civilians, and that's the big key point. What makes terrorists different than soldiers? Soldiers fight other soldiers. Sometimes soldiers fight civilians, but there are wars with soldiers, yes? Uh, terrorists, their war is with civilians in order to target governments. So it's cheaper, more effective than conventional war, thus accessible to small groups. September 11th, 2001, four planes are going to crash into the World Trade Center. Uh, you're going to have, of course, the Pentagon, Pennsylvania, and then you're going to have Osama bin Laden being the mastermind behind all of this. Okay, and he is the leader of Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda is going to be, um, the original start of terrorism here in the world. Now, it's funny, when uh, Osama bin Laden was running Al-Qaeda, he heard of this thing called ISIS, and he's like, whoa, they're too extreme for us. And here we are with ISIS. How wonderful. Goodbye, my darlings. Goodbye. Farewell. Of the oh, my God. Why am I singing today? <laughs>